Welcome to our Sabbath School class. My name is Robert Blaze and I'll be studying the scripture with you. And I'm so excited because this quarter we're going to be studying the book of Daniel. We're going to find out more about this impressive character. We're going to find more about the prophecies and we're going to learn more about God right here on ADTV. Welcome back to Amazing Discovery Sabbath School Study. As we do every week, we will be going through a chapter. Uh, we are studying the book of Daniel, and we will have a short review, and then we'll get straight into it. But before we do, let's pray. Father, today, we, as we present ourselves before you, we thank you for having been so good to us in the past week. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you have provided. And Father, as we open your word today, we I cannot do it without your assistance. Father, we need you to guide us through your spirit, to teach us, to instruct us, and to show us, Lord, what we ought to be focused on, what we ought to understand. And I know, Father, that you want us to know, you want us to understand that we may be prepared for the things that are about to transpire. And so, Father, I ask that you first forgive us from our sins, that you cleanse us, and that you help us, Lord, to be solely focused on you and on your will. I pray, Lord, that you give us a, a heart ready to understand, a mind ready to comprehend, and that, Lord, as we submit ourselves to you, you can take control and take over and get us through not only our study now, but through our lives faithfully. Thank you, Father, for being generous with us. Bless us now, I pray this, in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. Last week, we were studying the book of Daniel, chapter 10, and we discovered that Daniel got a, a glimpse of what happens behind the scenes, what we do not normally see. He saw how uh, angels, heavenly um, beings, actually work on the behalf of men to accomplish the will of God on earth. Daniel was praying and he had a vision of a man. And this man we found out was Jesus. Daniel got to see Jesus. Now just that is amazing. But then Gabriel was commissioned to him, commissioned to come and to tell him things that would shortly come to pass. We, as we studied, we discovered that indeed that was Gabriel. And although the prophet was very old, God still had a work for him, a purpose, and still had information for him. After strengthening Daniel, we are now, and Daniel is, and we are now prepared to dive into chapter 11. Now, before we go on, we will look at our memory text. So if you'd like to turn with me to Daniel chapter 11, and our memory text is found in verse 35. It reads, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Our lesson this week is called From North and South to the Beautiful Land. And here we have what I would say a familiar theme where we have persecution, trial, there's a cleansing of sin. But very specifically, there's the concept, this idea again of the time of the end. And it's important to notice that that time is actually predefined because it says it is yet for an appointed time. In our human sphere, it's, it's hard for us to, to actually understand, to understand this, both its duration and its end. But we have the assurance from the word of God that it is a real period of time in which God is in charge, in which God has determined that he would um, bring to an end the great controversy. Now, as we study chapter 11 of Daniel, I just want to make a disclaimer immediately. Daniel 11 is a, is a very complex chapter. It has a lot of information. And in the time that we have, we definitely will not be able to go in as much depth as we would like to. But as we study it, we're at least going to get a really good overview. We'll see the big picture. And there's different interpretations as to some of the event, but the, 
the general timeline is pretty straightforward. And, and this is what I believe we need to focus on. We need to be consistent with what we've been studying before. And as we see more and more detail, we're going to find out how God is not taken by surprise by anything that happens in history because he has foreseen it. And as he has foreseen it, he has instructed Daniel as to what will take place for his benefit and for ours. So that when we come to the time of the end, which we've discovered is right now, we will not be left in the dark. So let's look a little bit of what Daniel 11 looks like. And I'm going to break it down a little bit differently on my board today. But in, in verse 1, we basically have an introduction. Now, in verse 2, we'll be looking at Medo-Persia, but more specifically, Persia. Uh, in verses 3 to 13, we'll be looking at the kingdom of Greece. In verses 14 through 30, or the whereabouts, we'll be looking at Rome, specifically in its pagan form, followed by verses 31 to 39, where again we look at Rome, but in its papal form. And finally, we'll be looking at verses 40 to 45. And this is a very important period of time because we'll be looking at the time of the end. And so this is how we will break down our, our chapter today. And so let's start immediately by looking at verse 1. Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Here we have a continuation, which is a direct continuation of chapter 10. Remember that 10, 11, 12 works together as a unit. And here we have Gabriel, whom we have already established, confirming and affirming that it is, he is the same person that was there back in our previous chapter who was help, helping Daniel to understand the prophecies of Daniel 9. Continuing in verse 2 as we uh, jump to our, our next uh, portion here. It says, And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. And so here, Gabriel wastes no time. He gets immediately into kingdoms that we are already familiar with, and he doesn't spend so many verses. And he gives us a little bit of Persia, because uh, the, the, the Medes no longer rule since uh, after the first Darius. And he tells us that in Persia, there would be four kings that would arise after um, the present king, which is Cyrus. And so we are looking at Cambyses, who is the son of Cyrus, we are looking at somebody called False Myrdis, Darius I. Now, it's important to, to remember and to know that many kings have the same name. And this Darius I is also Darius the Great, who is different than Darius the Medes. This guy is a Persian. Darius the Mede was also the son of Ahasuerus. And so this is a different Darius. Uh, in fact, um, Darius the Mede was also believed to be uh, Siaxares, which was the last Median king. And finally, our last Persian king uh, for now is Xerxes, uh, who in um, Esther is known as Ahasuerus, which is different Ahasuerus than the father of the first Darius. Now, Xerxes actually is the one who stirred up Greece according to the prophecy, which is true. He, he gathered armies from all over the place to rage war. Now, just so you know, these names, some people have a different view on them. They uh, decide to remove false Smyrdas from there because they say he's not a legitimate uh, son. And so they, 
they, they removed uh, false murders, moved on Cambyses and spoke of Cyrus as the first, but everyone agreed that the fourth king is definitely Xerxes, the one who was rich. Now, as for Greece, uh, we have just a, a little bit of things that are repeated and things will get expended. Uh, it is a, you know, a repeat and expand strategy. So the first mighty king obviously is Alexander the Great, uh, which we've already covered. Now, when Alexander died, he didn't have any children, and so his kingdom was broken down among his generals, and eventually there are four of them that comes out as more powerful than the rest. So we have uh, Cassander, we have Ptolemy, we also have uh, Lysimachus, and finally Seleucus. These were the most prominent four that came out immediately after um, Alexander the Great. So now in a, just a few verses, everything that we've been seeing in chapter 2, in chapter 7, and in chapter 8 is very quickly summarized because we already have that information. Gabriel is more interested in what's going to come up next. And in the next few verses, we're going to have the expression king of the north and king of the south. Now, th there's a point that's important is because we need to find out, we need to understand what makes them north and what makes them south. What makes the king of the north north and the king of the south south? For example, if I'm on the border of Canada and the United States, the United States would be south. But if I'm on the border of the Mexico-USA uh, border, then the USA, the United States is now north. And so we need to find out what is the point of reference that categorized this as a king of the north and king of the south. And that has been given to us in the previous chapter in verse 14. Gabriel told Daniel, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. So the center that defines the north and the south is the people of God. Now in this period of time, the people of God are located in Jerusalem and in Israel. And so they're the one at the center of the conflict. And we're gonna see there's a lot of war happening, there's a lot of back and forth, and the people of God are right there in the middle. And they are suffering from these conflicts, they're always involved and there's always um, you know, difficulties that falls on them. Now, uh, the, the conflict from verses five to 14, 13, 14, involves the Seleucid uh, kingdom, which is at the north, and the Ptolemies, which are in the south. Now, sometimes the king of the south is known as the king of Egypt, because that's where they were located. Now, verse 5 tells us, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. So the king of the south is actually Ptolemy here. Okay, so we're going to put the king of the south. Seleucus will actually become the king of the north. What happens is um, when they were all split, Seleucus was in, in Babylon, but um, Antigonus came and, and pretty much kicked him out. He placed himself under Ptolemy and he became a great admiral he went back, he removed the son of Antigonus and took over the north. And then he began to expand its territory and it actually became much larger than the one from Ptolemy. Verse 6, And in the end of years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But he shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up. And they that brought her, and he that beget her, and he that strengthened her in these time. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail. And shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Now, you will notice as we, as we look through these uh, different passages that the Bible doesn't go from one king to the next thing, king, one person to the next person. It emphasizes the most important people in history. 
And in that passage, we have a lot of political intrigue. We have marriage, assassination, revenge. And what we have here is what most uh, commentators believe that the daughter there of the South is actually Berenice, who was uh, married to Antiochus. But then she was assassinated along with her infant son. And even Antiochus, her husband, was actually murdered, poisoned by Laodice. And so you have all these things happening. And then at that point, her brother, uh, Ptolemy III, raged a conquest against Seleucus II. And you'll, you'll find out that there's a, a lot of people that have the same name. There's like about 15 Ptolemies, uh, seven Cleopatras, um, uh, Seleucus is in, in the tens as well. So there's a, a lot of people with the same name. So we don't want to get confused. We want to find out the flow of history. Uh, then in verse 9, we read that the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his homeland. So now we have Ptolemy III who returns to Egypt. And then we read in, in verse 10 that his son, and now we're talking about the son of the king of the north, and you'll see it in context when we get to 11. It says, but his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And that's why we believe that the two sons are the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. Now, when we had uh, Ptolemy the third, then he had two sons. His first uh, son was Seleucus the third, as well as Antiochus the third. And these two decided to uh, take revenge and to fight. And they fought again Ptolemy the third. And then as we continue, we find out in verse 12, and when he had taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after a certain years with a great army and with much riches. Now by then, um, Ptolemy IV was in power, and he died, and then his son, Ptolemy V, um, was actually only five years old when they placed him on the throne. And so Antiochus thought it was a really good time to come in and to conquer the place. And then we have something interesting that happens in, in verse 14, kind of like a, a parenthesis, a foreshadow of what's going to come. We read, and in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Now here, scholars have identified or have uh, established that the robbers of the people is Rome. So Rome makes kind of like an introduction, letting us know that during all these conflict, all these fight, Rome was brewing up. Rome was coming up as a power. The, some people say that they only actually comes on the scene officially on verse 16, but somewhere between 14 and 16, Rome makes an appearance for sure. Now, the robbers of the people uh, can be translated as those that act violently against your people. And it's kind of like a precursor of how Rome will be treating the people of God, both the Jews at the time and also the Christians in later years. And so we have a glimpse of what we will discover very soon. Verse 15, so the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither is chosen people, neither shall there, any strength, shall there be any strength to withstand. And so this is the story of Antiochus when he was conquering Gaza. And now we are going to shift officially to Rome. In verses 16 to 19, we read, But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which is by his hand shall be consumed. 
and he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of woman, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. After this fall, after this shall he turn his face unto the isle and shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. A lot of things hap happening here. And so we have an interesting story. So in, in these days, we had Ptolemy the 11th. And he was married to Cleopatra. So let's put Cleopatra here. Now, Cleopatra was actually having an affair with Julius Caesar. Now, when Julius Caesar um, spent a lot of time in Egypt where he should not have, he should have been with his people, but he was in love, he was having an affair. When he came back, he eventually got assassinated. And so she decided to look for Mark Antony. So Mark Antony. And she was having an affair with him as well. But then eventually Mark Antony committed suicide. And so she looked for the son of Julius Caesar, whose name was Octavius. Later he was renamed Augustus. And Augustus was not interested in Cleopatra. And so she was having a, a lot of difficulty, a lot of problem, and she ended up herself committing suicide. And that's why in the passage here, we, we talk, we see the daughter of woman that people believe is definitely Cleopatra the seventh, actually. And that um, she shall not stand by his sign, side, that is Julius Caesar, and neither be for him. She couldn't care less really much about Julius Caesar. She was just there for her own advantages. Now, it's also during that time that Ptolemy the 11th took his children and put them under Rome to make sure that they would be safe. And this officially here ended the Ptolemies of the South. They were no longer in rule and Rome kind of like took over at that time. Verse 18, 19 actually point more specifically to Julius Caesar. After he left Egypt, he actually had a lot of naval conquests, but then few years later, as it says, as he went back home, he was assassinated and he was no more. Verse 20 tells us that in the place of Julius Caesar, there would be somebody called a raiser of tax. Verse 20, then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Now, interestingly, by the time we get here, we're in the New Testament era because Augustus Caesar in Luke 2.1, it declared that all of the world should be taxed. So that's our razor of taxes right there. And he died several years later after ruling in his bed very peacefully. After him, verse 21, we read, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. This is Tiberius Caesar. Now Tiberius was the only son of Augustus. He got to the kingdom, no controversy, very easy, very peaceably, but he was not very liked. And he had a lot of controversy. And one of the things that we just read is he also was involved in the broken down of the Prince of the Covenant. Now, this should sound familiar because in chapter 9, verses 25 to 27, we read about the Prince who confirms the Covenant. That's the Messiah. That's Jesus. It was during Tiberius' reign that Jesus was crucified under the governor Pontius Pilate. Now, the next section that we're, we're going to pass a little faster over is verses 23 all the way to 29. This cover uh, Nero, Diocletian, and finally it moves to Constantine. So these are the kind of the next little batch here. And so let's just read through it. Verse 23. 
And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall come strong, shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his father hath not done, nor his father's father. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed on the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' heart shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. But it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. And at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So once again, lots of information here, lots of ideas, lots of concept, lots of battle, lots of fighting, uh, which can easily be traced back to Nero and, and Diocletian. But when we get to the end, which is very interesting, it talks about that at the time appointed, they will come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. As we know, by the time we get toward the end of the Roman as the powerful nation, there's a lot of difficulties. The Roman nation is breaking apart. Most scholars have associated that very last passage about the former and the latter with Constantine, Constantine who chose to move his seat, the Roman seat, from Rome to Byzantium, which he renamed later Constantinople. It was an attempt to obviously bring back the glory of Rome, but that didn't work too well. And on top of that, there were the Germanic tribes that were threatening the stability of Rome, which most people believe this is what the next verse is actually alluding to in verse 30. It says, for the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do, he shall re return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Here, most people look at the ship of Shittim here as having something to do with the Vandals. They were a great naval army. And as we come across this passage, we now shift from the pagan Rome to the papal Rome era. And as you notice, this, this transition is marked by this idea here where we talk about holy covenant. This is religious language. Everything before that was political, but now we're more in the religious realm. We have some spiritual application. And, and look at the next few verses. It says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall stay away, take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that is happening in Papal Rome. I mean, look at some of the description. They pollute the sanctuary, take away the daily sacrifice, the abomination that makes desolate. They do wickedly against the covenant. And so you have all these idea of departure from what had previously been the holy faith, the, the more apostolic teaching of the Bible. Rome, in its papal form, introduces changes in doctrine. They, they change the law, they, they add some um, commandments of man, if you will, tradition from pagan origins. And so there's a, a dilution of the actual teaching from the Bible. Which leads, in the next few verses, to the Dark Ages. Already here you had people that says that they know their God. And because they knew their God, they would do certain exploits. And as they do this, ex this exploit, we, we can think of people like the Waldenses and the Albigenses, the people that would stand and that would oppose the papal changes that were coming up. Verse 33. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, 
Yea, they shall fall by the sword and by flames, by captivity and by spoils many days. This is clearly religious persecution. Clearly, those who knew the truth, refused to adhere to papal truth, or whatever their teaching was, were being threatened, martyred, killed, destroyed. As they that understand stood for what was truth, automatically attacks came their way. This is true then, this is true now. If you've been looking at the news lately, you've been seeing how people who want to stand for the biblical truth are being persecuted. This is only a glimpse of what is coming up very shortly. Verse 34, we read, Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Here again, clearly, here you have a, a, a view of what the Reformation would look like, as they that would hold to the truth would fall. But they would hold to the truth, they would be tried, they would be purged, and the persecution would continue because it is yet for a time appointed, for the time of the end. Following the next section, verse 36 to 39, there's many elements uh, and, and almost word for word reference to what we've studied before in the previous chapter. And each and every one of these references almost all point clearly to the little horn of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. So let's go through them. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that he is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of woman, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall, be on, shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his father knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. I mean, there's a there's clear association here with some of the elements that we had already studied about the little horn. Now, some people have I've looked at this passage and said, no, this represents France in their uh, revolution. The problem is, I mean, I can see why certain of these elements would fit, but the problem is that it departs from the chronology that had already been established in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8. And I think it's, it's more clear and to base ourselves on what we've already discovered clearly in the previous passages. Now, having said that, having seen this, this whole passage here about, you know, the papal power, reference to the little horn, we come to our last portion here, which is the time of the end. This is also one of the more elusive portion of the prophecy. And it makes sense because it is a future uh, application. We don't have any actual facts, actual historical evidence to be able to plug it in and to clearly have an idea. However, there are concepts and ideas and principles there that we can't escape to prepare us for what is coming up. So let's begin verse 40 as we go through our, our last leg of the chapter. And at a time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. He shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, as we studied before, we had established that one of the things that takes place at the time of the end is the judgment. We've also established that the judgment actually begins somewhere in 1844. And so we have a beginning to our uh, time of the end here. And so here we have another mention of the king of the north versus the king of the south. 
Now the king of the north has been clearly established in that passage as Rome. And here there is a final conflict because after that, the king of the south disappear. And if you've looked at all the element that comes, the king of the north seems to clearly eliminate the king of the south. We have here a final supremacy where the conflict between the king of the north comes to an end. And the people of God that had been uh, kind of like sandwiched in between are no longer sandwiched because now the king of the north takes complete control over everything. It goes on saying in verse 41, he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. So here we have this view that he enters into the glorious land and he takes over as well as many countries. But some people escape. And now that's very interesting because all of the people, uh, all the names that are mentioned representing the people that escape are all actually connected to Israel, to the people of God. Edom, which is Esau, the uh, brother of Jacob. Moab, which is actually the son of Lot. And Ammon, uh, which is the, uh, also ben Ami, the son of Lot as well, his two sons. Both of these... Uh, all three of those are connected through Abraham, which tells us that they have an understanding, they have a knowledge of the true God, but that knowledge has been corrupted. And interestingly enough, those that have a corrupted knowledge of the truth or a false truth or not a complete truth are the one that actually escapes. They escape the king of the north. They escape which tells me that those who hold firm to the real truth don't seem to be able to escape. Verse 42. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his step. Now here, there's another conquest that is happening. For uh, a first time, the king of the south is no longer mentioned. Now you have the land of Egypt, which seems to indicate that indeed, not only did the king of the north overcome, but the king of the south is not coming back. There is no longer an enemy in the south. Verse 44 tells us, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury and destroy and utterly to make away many. Here there's another conquest. The king of the north goes even more north and east, expanding his territory, expanding his influence, expanding by destroying and by utterly taking away many. When you start looking at this, you're starting to see a power that we've already established was ecclesiastical expanding politically. We seem to be looking at a complete political takeover. And as we see this, verse 45 will tell us that as political power expands and takes over, there's another aspect that is being taken over. Verse 45. And he shall plan the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Interesting language here because we've been talking about politics, politics in the last few verses. And here we have something that talks about tabernacles. That's, already, that's obviously a uh, religious uh, illusion. Seas and holy mountain. Seas representing people. Holy mountain is usually where God establishes his seat, his, uh, his spiritual leadership. This power takes over the seas and the holy mountain and place his leadership above everyone, his spiritual leadership. We have here uh, a power that takes over politically 
and ecclesiastically. It's, it's almost totalitarian. Everyone and everything under the final power at the end. But then the last verse tells us something that is reassuring. It tells us that yet he shall come to his hand and none shall help him. So despite this complete takeover, it will come to an end. It will not last forever. And the people of God that are stuck in this, in, in, in this environment will eventually be freed. Now, I understand this is a, a lot of information going and, and pretty quickly. And, and I think that the point at the end is we need to ask ourselves, what do I take out of this prophecy? What do I need to understand? There's so much more that we could go through, so much more time that we could dig, and we would be here for a long time. I think there's three important things that we need to understand. Is that, first of all, God knows what is coming and nothing surprises him. All these intrigue, all these political things happening, these assassination, these arranged marriage, these hostile takeover, doesn't surprise God. He knows it's coming, he knows it's happening, and it shouldn't surprise us either. Second, God knows the appointed time for our history, our fallen humanitarian history to come to an end. He knows when that's going to come because he predetermined it. He set a time for that and he will bring about the final events so that this will not mean anything to us anymore. But what is coming up after will be of greatest importance because God will indeed establish his kingdom. And I think the last thing that we we can take away from this is no matter where the, blend, the no matter where the wind blows whether politically or ecclesiastically there's only one safe ground and that is God's holy ground no matter what happens while we are on that ground no matter if we suffer if we're persecuted if we have difficulties if we have trials that is the safest place to be on it's clear there's a lot of things happening all around us. But the prophecy has one purpose, is to help us to understand that these things are normal and God is not ignorant of them. But he's preparing us. He wants us to come to a place where we can fully depend on him. The words for the people of the end time that Jesus commanded them was watch and pray because the final generation will only be able to endure all these things as if they watch and pray and are faithful to Jesus. Now, keep in mind that verse 45 is not the end of the prophecy. It's an unfortunate uh, break in the chapter, but chapter 12 is actually only a continuation. And as we will see in chapter 12, there's a lot of very important things for us to understand. Because chapter 12 not only wraps up the vision, wraps up the book of Daniel, but opens to us important information about the time that we live in right now. These are the final instruction from God to the last day people. And he chose Daniel to bring these to us. And so we need to continue to studying these things. I mean, like I said, we only scratch the surface. You and I, we have a duty to continue to open the Word, to continue to open the history book, to continue to open the, the commentaries, to discover more and more what God is trying to teach us, how He's trying to prepare us, so that we may stand firm no matter what comes our way. And so, until we meet next week and conclude the book of Daniel, let's take the time to study God's Word, God's prophecy. He will teach us better than any human teacher can. Let us pray. Father, we come to thank you. Lord, you, you don't leave us in ignorance, but you, you demand from us that we make an effort to understand. And Lord, there are so much more things to understand, so much more in your Bible for us to dig and to enjoy and to stimulate our intellect. Father, you want us to be knowledgeable you want us to be well equipped. 
but you also want us to make an effort. And I thank you, Father, for not having spoon-fed us everything, making us idle in our religion, idle in our Christianity. And I pray, Lord, as we move forward this week, that we will go back and study and study until we are well-grounded, well-founded, so that no matter what comes, Father, we may stand on the rock, Jesus Christ. Father, if we've went different ways, I ask that you forgive us now and strengthen us to move away from any sins that besets us, from anything that takes us away from you. Help our hearts and our mind to be stayed on you and on Jesus and to follow the Lamb wherever he leads us. Thank you, Father. And I pray this in the name of our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness, Jesus. Amen.